Liberty Me, here with Professor Matt Zielinski. He's a professor of philosophy at San Diego University and a contributor to Learn Liberty and Bleeding Heart Libertarians. Uh, thanks so much, Matt. Yeah, it's great to be here, Kyle. I'm, I'm looking forward yeah, to the conversation. Great to be here, Kyle. Is a focus on negative liberty a blind spot to a robust philosophy? Should individuals who are proponents of a more freedom or liberty-centric world pay more attention to what positive liberty entails, and, and why should they do that? Well, so uh, in, uh, in good philosophical spirit, let me start by, uh, by defining the terms a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. Um, so when philosophers talk about negative and positive liberty, uh, what they generally have in mind is the following sort of distinction. Uh, negative liberty involves a absence of a certain kind of interference with one's action. Uh, specifically, uh, philosophers who talk about negative liberty are usually referring to absence of uh, physical uh, interference with one's actions by other human agents. So, uh, for instance, if, uh, if you were trying to get from point A to point B and a, a tree fell down in the middle of the road and uh, prevented you from passing, uh, that wouldn't be an interference with your negative liberty, even though uh, it was a physical interference because uh, it wasn't uh, produced by another human agent, right? Unless, unless somebody actually pushed the tree in front of the road in front of you, then uh, we would say that would count uh, as an interference with your negative liberty. Positive liberty, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit harder to pin down. So we can start by noticing that um, lots of things can interfere with your ability to do what you want, not just the deliberate actions of other human beings. So for instance, uh, one thing that might prevent you from doing what you want is uh, a certain weakness of will. Uh, like you want, for instance, to uh, quit drinking alcohol uh, but you're addicted, and so you have a very hard time stopping yourself uh, from taking a drink, even though there's a sense in which that's what you most want to do, is, is precisely to stop. Uh, then we might stop, in which uh, you are not truly free because you're not truly self-directed. You're not self-governing and autonomous in the fullest sense of that word. Uh, so that's one kind of thing that people mean by positive liberty is this is this full kind of self-direction. Another thing that people sometimes mean by positive liberty is uh, something more like ability or efficacy. Uh, so uh, I might want, for instance, to uh, go to a baseball game in downtown San Diego, but if I don't have the money uh, to buy a ticket to that baseball game, then there's a sense in which, again, I'm not free to go to that game, not because, well, not exactly because anybody's stopping me from doing that, uh, but because I lack the resources that are necessary to carry out my plan. So sometimes when people talk about positive liberty, that's the kind of thing that they have in mind. Uh, but in general, right, the distinction comes down to this. Negative liberty means that you're free from other people interfering with you doing what you want to do, whereas positive liberty means something closer to the ability to do the ability to do that ability uh, is a is a function of other people's uh, interference or lack thereof. I, I just wonder if there's too much of a focus in terms of individuals who uh, purport to be uh, liberty minded, freedom minded on negative liberty. It's always freedom from something. And, right. you know, that's understandable because I, I think that that's more of, uh, you know, what we actually face. You know, we have obstructions of government. And yeah. there is a fear that once one enters into the realm of a philosophically positive liberty, that now we're talking about the right to, well, in terms of healthcare, right? The right to someone else's trade. Because, right. uh, you know, I should be healthy, therefore, I should have the right to take uh, the doctor's trade. I, sh I should have his, his medical care for free, right? Um, but perhaps that's not the way that we should look at positive liberty. Yeah, I think, I think you've identified yeah, I think the I worry identified that a lot of libertarians have uh, precisely, right? They, the worry is that if we accept this idea of positive liberty, as a, as a genuine kind of liberty, then, well, since we're libertarians and we're supposed to 
uh, favor the promotion of liberty, uh, then we're going to be led down this slippery slope to uh, having the government guarantee everyone's positive liberty in just the same way that perhaps we think uh, a government ought to guarantee uh, people's negative liberty. Um, that's that's the worry, but I uh, I think it's uh, a misguided worry. Uh, I think there's a there's a there's a logical jump there uh, between. Uh, admitting that positive liberty is a genuine moral value uh, and concluding that, uh, therefore, the government ought to be in the business of directly promoting or protecting that value. Um, those are two very, very different claims. And uh, it seems to me that we could, and, and as libertarians, I think perhaps we should, um, be willing to grant the former um, while still having uh, very, very strong reservations uh, about the latter. So, so let me explain, right? And I think, look, think about it this way. Why do we care about negative liberty, right? Why do we think that negative liberty is so important? Why do we think it's important that people be prevented from coercively interfering with your activity? Well, uh, because... Well, one of the one of the reasons, anyway, is that when people are coercively interfering with what you're trying to do, then you can't live your life the way you want to live your life, right? Um, if you're if you're being forced around at gunpoint um, by by somebody with superior power, then you have to live your life according to their vision of the good and their plans, and not according to your own, right? But notice notice what that suggests. It suggests that, in a sense. Negative liberty is kind of instrumentally valuable, right? The reason we don't want uh, people interfering with our negative liberty is because that is one way of preventing us from doing what we want to do, living our lives the way we see fit. It's the living our lives the way we see fit, though, that really matters. We want people to be able to do uh, what they want to do as long as they allow other people to do the same. And so, right, there's... We could admit, I think, that you know the, the more able people are to do what they want to do, for whatever reason, either because there's more opportunities open to them, or because there's fewer people interfering with them, or because people have greater control uh, over their own kind of uh, internal psychological states, that's a good thing. And it's a good thing in terms of liberty, right? It doesn't necessarily follow that the government ought to directly be in the business of trying to promote all of those kinds of liberty, right? Whether that's true or not depends on your view of, well, first of all, how you of liberty to try to do so. And secondly, on your view of individual rights, you might very well think that positive liberty is a good thing and yet also believe that any government attempts to promote positive liberty would interfere in an impermissible way with individual rights. So they're just the, the question of whether positive liberty is desirable and the question of whether government ought to be involved in promoting it, two completely different questions. Sure. So it seems to me that for the application of positive liberty, uh, we have sort of a, a two-pronged approach. On the one hand, we have a philosophical positive liberty. And uh, I think that this has to do a little bit with branding more than anything else. Uh, I think of the recent Jeffrey Tucker article on brutalism. Uh, I think of what the left libertarians talk about a lot, a thick libertarianism, uh, where, wherein one does not just think of liberty as um, I'm not being oppressed or I'm, I'm not being aggressed upon. It's a, it's a whole philosophy, a robust philosophy in which What's most important is that individuals are able to, like you said, live their life the way that they wish. And sometimes that means that probably voluntarily, I would, uh, I would hope voluntarily, that individuals would help that person through um, networks of people, uh, a voluntary social safety net perhaps, something like that. And then on the other hand, what we have are practical applications uh, in the world in which we live, uh, like through legislation. Um, you know, I, I don't know. You know, what, what do you think? Well, well, I, mean, I think you're right. There's, the, the, yeah, there's this distinction right. between, yeah, there's this between, between the philosophical ideal and the practical the reality, right? So, um, 
uh, uh, philosophically, I think it's it's perfectly coherent and sensible to um, to recognize this thing, right? This phenomenon that people are talking about as positive liberty, as something that is uh, is and and ought properly to be um, uh, a, a, a significant value, right? For um, for not just you know people on the left, but for people of a libertarian uh, persuasion, and celebrate uh, technological progress, right? We we kind of marvel at um, the technological progress that capitalism has made possible, and we point to this as uh, one of the not maybe the only, but one of the reasons why capitalism is a good and desirable social system. Um, but what is the? I mean, why do we do that, right? What's the What's the underlying philosophical rationale behind that kind of celebration? Well, it could be just that uh, technically on some kind of utilitarian ground, uh, these things are good and pleasurable and to be desired for that reason. Um, and that's that's true, I think. But uh, I think it also makes sense to celebrate technology uh, in terms of freedom, in terms of the ability that it gives individuals to, again, live their own lives according to their own vision of the good, their own desires, their own plans, right? Um, with technology, we're able to spend more time talking to the people that we want to talk with. Uh, we're able to spend more time doing the things that we want to do. It's easier to start a business, um, given the kinds of technological uh, innovations that have occurred over the last uh, half a century or so, right? These are all contributions to the betterment of human life, not just in terms of some narrow kind of pleasure or utility or happiness. I think these are real boons to freedom. And again, the labels deserve the term freedom for the strict, traditional, narrow, libertarian sense of the term. That's fine, too. Uh, but uh, this this kind of ability to, to guide one's own life is like freedom, um, like that negative freedom in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, whether or not you want to call it by the label of freedom or not isn't really the issue. The issue is whether it's something valuable and whether it's something that we as libertarians have good reason to celebrate, and I think we do. So what's a reason, what, what's a, uh, an example of legislation, perhaps, that would improve positive liberty, uh, you know, something like uh, the guaranteed, um, guaranteed income? There was an article uh, on BHL about that not long ago. You think that's a good idea? Uh, my good friend uh, Thad Russell seems to think that guaranteed income is is something, or guaranteed basic income, is something that uh, should be a definitive part of a libertarian philosophy. It's a complicated uh, social policy, and, and sorting out the uh, uh, the pros and cons is uh, is a fairly uh, difficult and messy business, um, but I but I think there's at least a lot to be said in favor of a basic income, certainly as a replacement uh, for many of the kind of paternalistic, invasive, costly, and bureaucratized welfare programs uh, that we currently have in the United States and most other Western democracies. I think uh, simply taking the money that we spend trying to fight poverty through these big government programs and writing the poor a check is a much better way of making their lives better, giving them more control over their lives, giving them ability to take that money and spend it on the things that they think are valuable, rather than on the things that some government bureaucrat thinks are valuable. Um, whether it's defensible in, in a stronger sense as a kind of first best ideal policy that all libertarians should endorse, uh, that I think is a, is a tougher case to, to make. I think there's, there's some case to be made there, um, but I'm, I'm not quite sure, uh, even myself, um, whether, uh, you know, once, once all the reasons for and con are, are uh, counted, whether uh, the policy emerges as, uh, as fully defensible. I should point out, though, that um, right, policies like the basic income uh, and other kinds of redistributive policies, um, including, for instance, public education, um, these are all ways in which governments might promote positive liberty in a fairly direct way, right? I mean, you think um, you want to give people more control over their lives, so you give them certain resources uh, or access to kind of certain opportunities to directly uh, improve their ability to control their own lives. Um, 
There are also, however, and I think this is this is the thing that libertarians think this is this is the thing that haven't emphasized or noticed as much as they should emphasize or notice. There are ways of indirectly promoting positive liberty. And indeed, I think you know, many of the standard libertarian proposals for uh, getting the state out of the market and letting economic growth take off on its own are themselves policies that can be thought of as promoting positive liberty, albeit in a kind of indirect way, right? We, we get the government out of the market knowing that with the government largely out of the market, uh, economic growth is going to emerge as a kind of uh, unintended uh, but foreseeable result of uncoordinated human action, right? But that's a much more effective way, we as libertarians know, of ultimately giving people control over, the, over their lives than by directly trying to give them control over their lives by writing them a check, right? Redistribution of wealth only works if there's wealth there to redistribute. So you've got to grow the wealth in the first place before you can start worrying about how to divide up the pie. But the growth of wealth isn't generally a process that takes place as the result of a deliberate decision by a government agency, right? It's the unintended side effect. It's the unintended side effect. Action, try people trying to make a little money for themselves and their families in the marketplace. So that's a positive liberty program, even if the promotion of positive liberty isn't usually the direct aim of such a program. Sure. <clears throat> You've been critical of the non-aggression principle as a philosophy in and of itself, right? As the beginning and the end of a philosophy. Right. That reminds me of what we've just discussed, of the positive and negative uh, liberty aspects. Um, what do you think is necessary in addition to the non-aggression principle in order to create a whole and robust philosophy? That's good. I'm, I'm glad you asked That's the question I'm, I'm in, in that particular question. way, uh, that because particular uh, way. I don't because, believe, uh, actually, uh, that the non-aggression uh, principle the non ought to be rejected out of hand. Uh, what I object to is uh, treating the non-aggression principle as a kind of inviolable axiom of, uh, of political and moral philosophy, um, such that uh, you know, we think we can derive all, all the guidance there is to be got um, uh, regarding at least simply by looking at this this one simple and absolute principle. Um, I think you know. I think non-aggression is a good principle, uh, but not in an absolute rule. Uh, so what what do I think needs to be taken into account um, beyond non-aggression? Well, for instance, I think uh, that it's important when thinking about political philosophy uh, to think in uh, teleological or um, as some might say, consequentialist terms, in addition to uh, the kind of deontological or rights-based terms that the non-aggression principle represents. And to ask ourselves, um, what happens when governments involve themselves in uh, economic decision-making? Or what happens when governments don't involve themselves in economic decision-making? I think you know, the results of different kinds of policies matter in terms of uh, our moral assessments of those policies. And uh, if the results were very different from uh, the way I think they are in most cases, right? If it turns out that uh, you know the Marxists were right and that capitalism really does lead to uh, unending alienation and exploitation and, and immiserization of the working poor, I think that would be uh, a strong moral charge against capitalism. And I don't think we could adequately rebut that charge merely by pointing out that uh, any kinds of deviations from capitalism uh, would involve an interference with the non-aggression principle. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I know you have somewhere you need to be, but uh, I appreciate you taking the time out to be here, and uh, it's been fantastic. Yeah, it was a real pleasure for me too, pal. Thanks. Yeah.